viewers, I'm your host Usma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show with India where government continues to push for digital economy in a post-demonetization scenario. Efforts are being made to promote digital modes of payment to clean the system and weed out corruption and black money. We have a report. The demonetization drive last year pushed more Indians to fall in line with Narendra Modi government's digitization agenda. At present, digital payments account for 15% of the $1.5 trillion worth of consumer spending in the country. Post demonetization, digital transactions in volume had increased by 42% from 672 million in November 2016 to 958 million in December 2016. The digital transactions saw a decline of 20% over two months to 763 million in February 2017. However, the government remains optimistic and continues to push online payments. I see 2017 as a year in which uh, a combination of the GST being implemented and a digitized economy I think will be the future of India. And they lay down uh, the footsteps for further growth in India. And I'm sure India will continue to maintain its pivotal position in the world. The government of India and Google have announced a set of initiatives to ensure secure digital payments and to create community awareness on safe and secure digital practices. Among a slew of initiatives, Google and India's Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology announced the launch of a Digital Payment Security Alliance for the government's digital and financial inclusion programs. Google said it was delighted to support Modi's vision of creating a new India where technology unleashes a wave of new opportunities. Our mission in India is very simple. Internet for every Indian. A connected India will access to the whole web, will help businesses grow, power education, and create massive growth opportunities across every aspect of India's economy. This is in line with the Honorable Prime Minister's vision for a connected India, with its focus on development, growth, opportunity, and governance for every single citizen of India. Google also focused on bridging the massive digital gender divide in rural India, as only one out of ten internet users in rural India is a woman. It also launched an initiative, Internet Sarthi, in partnership with Tata Trust to do ground activation in 300,000 Indian villages by the end of 2018. Among other initiatives, Google and MEITY also proliferated the Indic web for enhancing government's online presence on mobile platforms to enable citizen engagement and training building programs on digital tools. Government's push for digital economy has opened new avenues in sectors like communication, IT services, digital delivery, e-commerce and cyber security. Now we talk about Pakistan's Balochistan province where the number of enforced disappearances is on the rise. Baloch activists and human rights campaigners are blaming the Pakistani army and other law enforcement agencies for targeting political activists and their family members. We have this report. protest outside the Pakistani embassy in London demanded the release of Baloch activist Zahid Baloch, who was abducted in March 2014 from a university in Pakistan's Balochistan province. An ex-chairman of the Baloch student organization, Azad, Zahid was engaged in political activities and was raising the issues concerning the Baloch people. The protesters were carrying posters to raise the issue of enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings in Balochistan. Pakistan. Pakistan. Pakistani security forces ko ye bataaye ki aapne jitne bhi beguna Baloch, masoom Balochon ko unki akiki jadujad ke badash mein agwa kya hai, gaab kya hai, am unse 
ہم انہیں بھولے نہیں ہیں ہم ان کے ان کی یاد میں ہیں وہ اپنی سرزمین اور اپنی سرزمین کی آزادی کے لیے ایک عقیقی جد وجہد کر رہے تھے اور ان کا حق ہے کہ وہ جد وجہد کریں پاکستان کے ساتھ ہمارا کوئی رشتہ نہیں پاکستان نے انیس سو اڑتالیس میں بلجبر بلجبر ہمیں ہم پر قبضہ کیا ہمارے وطن پر قبضہ کیا اور انہیں اپنا حصہ بنایا اگر ہم آج آزادی کی بات کرتے ہیں یہ ہمارا حق ہے The grim situation in Balochistan, where thousands of political activists, intellectuals and students are missing, was recently raised at the 34th session of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Baloch activists and human rights campaigners participated in the event where they sought UN intervention to ensure safe release of those abducted by security forces. The kidnapping and killing of women, children and elderly people in Balochistan is shocking. تقریباً 2005 سے لے کے اس سے بلکہ پہلے سے لے کے ابھی تک یہ بڑھ رہا ہے اور پہلے تو یہ تھے کہ عورتیں اور بچوں کو جو ہے اور بوڑھوں کو وہ جو ہے ڈسپیئر نہیں کرتے تھے مگر ابھی جو ہے پورے پورے خاندان جو ہے وہ ڈسپیئر کیے جا رہے ہیں ان کو اٹھا کے غیب کیا جا رہا ہے اور بہت سے ایسے بھی ہیں عورتوں کے بھی ایسے لاشیں ملی ہیں جن کو جو ہے انہوں نے ٹارکچر کر کے اور ویرانوں میں جو ہے انہوں نے پھینکا ہے اور ایک دو ایسے انسٹنسز بھی آئے ہیں کہ عورتوں کو جو ہے انہوں نے لے جا کے ٹارچر کر کے اور پھر ہیلی کاپٹر سے پہاڑوں میں پھینک ہے The army and Pakistan rangers are carrying out human rights abuses in Balochistan, the largest province, as well as a resource-rich one, where the people are fighting for sovereignty for decades. The locals are also opposing construction of the China-Pakistan economic corridor as they claim that Pakistan and China are trying to grab their land in the name of development. The project consists of rail, road and pipelines to ferry oil and gas from Gwadar port on Arabian Sea to Kashgar in China's Xinjiang province. The Pakistan government has resorted to genocide in Balochistan to make the multi-billion dollar project successful. My colleague Ravi Khandelwal spoke with Hatim Baloch, a political activist who hails from Balochistan. Uh, Hatim, there is a constant fear among the people in Balochistan because the number of enforced disappearances and human rights abuses is, is, is rising day by day. So what is the real situation out there in Balochistan? As you said, it's getting worse day by day. And today, the whole area of Kolwa and Awarans are under siege. And uh, many people are being abducted. And I don't know yet, we are waiting for the further reports and uh, it's getting worse day by day and we are facing a uh, genocide of our nation. Why is it getting worse? There are different reasons because Pakistan is just free and they did not allow it any uh, media uh, groups to visit the area and there is no any international access there and Pakistan just blocked, the army blocked everywhere and what they want, they are doing the same, and they are repeating the history of Bangladesh and Balochistan. Who are the real victims in Balochistan? Because there are reports, you know, that they are targeting women and children as well. Yeah, last uh, 8th of March, they uh, arrested a lady. She was five months pregnant from a hospital, and still she is met missing. And there was a mass grave discovered in Derabukti, and there were uh, uh, the death bodies of ladies who are found there in these mass graves. And just recently, two days before, in uh, Marmasi and Thanak area of Mashke, many uh, women are being abducted and brought to Gajar army camp. Why do you think that the civilian government in Pakistan, they are not really concerned about what is happening there in Balochistan? Because they don't care, and for them, uh, might be we are not human being and they just want to oppress us want to make us their slaves and when we raised our voices they just want to crush us with the power with brutality with suppressions and this is going on since the occupation of 
our uh, homeland. Balochistan is uh, one of the largest and it's a resource-rich uh, province of Pakistan. So uh, does only uh, Pakistan care about its resources and not the people? Yeah, it seems like that. This is uh, the unfortunate that Pakistan is just looting the resources and killing the people. And uh, we are seeing this is happening since our occupation. Is there any hope? Yeah, always we hope for the best that one day we can get uh, our land free uh, and we can get back our freedom from Pakistani occupation and we will live free as a secular and welfare state. Thank you, Adil. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Moving on, India and Nepal share a warm relationship of friendship and cooperation characterized by open borders and deep-rooted people-to-people contacts. Recently, Nepal's Deputy Prime Minister Bimledra Nidhi visited New Delhi to strengthen ties. We have a report. The visit of Nepal's Deputy Prime Minister Bimledra Nidhi to New Delhi comes at a critical time for the Himalayan nation, which has a political turmoil brewing up. Nidhi, who came to attend the third annual counter-terrorism conference in the Indian capital, met Prime Minister Narendra Modi and other prominent leaders and discussed bilateral issues. Rising threat of terrorism in South Asia was comprehensively discussed and ways of curbing it were deliberated upon. Nidhi, who is also the Interior Minister of Nepal, sought assistance from India for the peaceful conduct of local elections in Nepal, slated for May this year. The Nepal government has been facing opposition by Madheshi parties, whose campaign for amendment of the constitution and opposition to the local elections continues. However, India has asked Nepal to go for polls by accommodating all political forces. India has always helped Nepal maintain political stability and peace. To understand the bilateral relations between the neighbors better, we are now joined by Nishchal Nath Pandey, Director of the Centre for South Asian Studies in Kathmandu. Mr. Nishal, how significant was the visit of Nepal's Deputy PM to India in strengthening bilateral ties between the two neighbours? Nepal and India share a unique relationship. Uh, uh, we have an open border system. The Nepalese uh, living and working in India do not need any permit. Uh, we do not need visa to travel to India. And similarly, the Indians do not need any visa to travel to Nepal. It is a unique relationship. However, uh, Nepal's politics is unstable. Uh, the Prime Minister and the Ministers keep on changing. Not only the Cabinet, but also state institutions like the police are, are also victims of this political instability. That brings Indo-Nepal relations into domestic politics. And it drags domestic politics into Indo-Nepal relations, which is unfortunate. I think the visit of not only the Home Minister of Nepal, but also other uh, visits of the dignitaries between the two countries will help uh, assuage Delhi about its concerns in Nepal. Nepal is passing through a crucial period where holding local elections is utmost priority for the government. What sort of role does Nepal expect India to play? Nepal promulgated its uh, democratic federal constitution last year through an elected constituent assembly. However, we have not been able to implement the constitution fully due to the fact that a large section of the Nepali people living in the plains area have not owned this constitution. Therefore, they have been saying that this constitution needs to be amended at the earliest so that local polls can be held and all the other salient features of the constitution can be implemented. But uh, we have been dilly-dallying on that issue. And Nepal also has had, as you know, uh, gross political instability with the nine prime ministers in 10 years. So therefore, it is very important for Nepal to stabilize its politics at the moment through implementing the constitution and holding local polls by satisfying the Madesi parties who are now agitating. South Asia is badly affected by terrorism. How can India and Nepal help fight against terrorism to ensure peace and stability in the region? Well, as you correctly said, uh, South Asia is a victim of terrorism. Uh, major terrorist incidents have taken place in this sub-region 
in the recent past. Nepal itself has been victim of uh, Maoist insurgency for the last uh, 10 years, which we successfully resolved in 2006. Uh, in the recent past, uh, there has been a lot of cooperation and coordination between Nepal and its neighbors for thwarting terrorist attacks, for sharing of intelligence and uh, other areas of activity such as military cooperation, joint military exercises. I think these will strengthen our ties with our neighbors. We have to also make sure that there is better coordination at the ground level because we share an open border with India. And uh, I think the major concern will be that if political instability continues in Nepal, if state institutions are grossly politicized, if corruption at the highest helm of affairs continue, then this will be uh, affecting not only at the grassroots level but also the local level coordination. Therefore, we have to make sure that these things are corrected at the earliest. Thank you, Mr. Nishchal. Now we talk about Pakistan's controversial blasphemy law which carries a potential death sentence for anyone who insults Islam. Minorities in Pakistan have always been persecuted under this draconian law. Now the establishment has taken its fight against blasphemy to social media to take action against those who are guilty of the offence online. We have a report. The disappearance of four bloggers and social media activists from different cities across Pakistan early this year reveals the growing insecurity among online writers in the country. Though the bloggers were released after a month, radical clerics have accused them of blasphemy. Now, Pakistan's Interior Minister Chaudhary Nisar Ali Khan said they will punish social media companies if they fail to take action against the offence online. The government wants social media networks to remove material deemed insulting to Islam or the Prophet Muhammad and Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. Agar social media or khastor pe international social media isi raaste pe rahi aur hamari tamam koshishon pe pani khuda na khasta phir gaya jo mujhe ummeed hai ki nahi phirega magar agar phir gaya to phir hum sakht tareen iktamad is social media ke hawale se karenge social media mere mazhab aur mere iman se zyada ahem nahi hai Right groups say the law is frequently abused in a country where Islam is a highly sensitive subject and where even rumours of blasphemy have sparked deadly riots. According to figures from a Centre for Research and Security Studies report, at least 65 people, including lawyers, defendants and judges, have been murdered over blasphemy allegations since 1990. In an event titled Persecution of Christians in Pakistan at the United Nations in Geneva, the members of minority community highlighted their plight in Pakistan and raised voice for justice. जो पाकिस्तानी मेनोरिटीज हैं, खास तौर पे जो ब्लास्फेमी केसेस हैं, उसकी वजह से एक लटकती तलवार है जो हर क्रिश्चियन पे, हर मेनोरिटी के बंदे पे लटकती रहती है, और कोई भी शख्स अगर किसी के साथ उसका कोई कॉन्फ्लिक्ट है, वो पर्सनल है, वो बिजनेस है, वो सोशल है, कोई भी इश्यू है तो वो किसी भी वक्त उसको जो है वो इस ब्लास्फेमी के जिम्मेरे में लेके आ सकता है और उसको बाज केसेस में उसी वक्त जो पर्सन होता है जिस पे जो क्यूज्ड पर्सन होता है उसको उसी वक्त जो है वो डेथ सेंटेंस उसी वक्त तो नाउस कर देते हैं उसी वक्त मार भी देते हैं Both the government and radical Islams in Pakistan are using blasphemy law as a tool to silence dissent that has flourished in the country. Anyone who criticizes politics, military and raises voices for freedom of speech and women's rights are labelled as blasphemers in Pakistan.
use of blasphemy law in Pakistan is sheer violation of human rights. Moving on, now we take you to Kabul, where a barber turned rapper, Sayyid Jamal Mubarez, was recently crowned winner of an Afghan talent show, Afghan Star. <laughs> Syed Jamal Mubarez, 23, a barber turned rapper, emerged as the winner of the Afghan talent show Afghan Star, beating the first female finalist of the competition. Mubarez, who comes from Hazara ethnic minority, won viewers over the lyrics capturing both the hope and despair of young people in the war torn country. The sole breadwinner at his home in the northwestern city of Mazar e Sharif, Mubarez discovered rap in Iran as he used to sing while cutting hair. This year's edition stood out after a female 18 year old singer Zulala Hashmi reached the final for the first time, defying widespread attitudes against women performers. Afghan star, modeled on singing contests popular across the world, is in its 12th season. Audiences were thrilled listening to talented singers. مبارزه علاقمندش هستم چون استعداد بالا داره علاقمندش هستم که اول چه بود بختاری که بار اول از یک خانم بسیار پیش آمده و بخاطر خانم زلاله خواستم بیایم برنامه را از نزدیک ببینم نیو ایر موزیشن سترگل تو میک ایت بگ این افغانستان where the Taliban once banned music and many disapprove of western style popular culture and artists often seek the safety and freedom of a life abroad. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. I take your leave with some images of Amazon Fashion Week held recently in New Delhi. Goodbye and take care.